the things that we're, we're of course, discussing today are, are issues that are going to, that can thwart the settlement of your case. But I'd, I'd like to kind of emphasize first by saying that uh, some of what Carl had already indicated, that I think that settlement is, is really, um, in most cases, the preferable way to be able to get your case resolved. And the more work that you put into at the get-go of the case, uh, if you need to perform discovery, if you can reach an agreement with your opposing counsel to be able to uh, do informal discovery so that you've got all the information necessary, really the preparation of mediation and, and what you put into that is really going to determine whether or not you're going to be successful. Um, it's always better not to turn, for example, a mediation session into a discovery session because you're not then prepared to be able to discuss the issues you know, in the case before doing so. Um, given the wide range of discretion that the judicial officers have, I think that the other thing that's good about settlement is your ability to be able to control uh, what the outcome is going to be. It's some certainty for your clients to be able to do so. And so my opinion is, and in my practice, you know, the more preparation that you can do uh, to be able to try to get the case settled, uh, getting everything that you need to be able to make sure that you know what the issues are in the case, that you're able to discuss those issues meaningfully at the time of the mediation is something that that, that preparation is going to assist in. So um, one of the issues, though, that does come up uh, in terms of uh, uh, being able to uh, thwart settlement in certain circumstances is, is spousal maintenance. And um, I think that the first determination that you've got to make when you've got an issue of spousal maintenance is whether or not this the case that you have is actually a, a spousal maintenance case. Um, let me give you kind of a hypothetical, hypothetical scenario in which um, this is geared towards you concluding that there would be some spousal maintenance paid in this case. Let's say you've got a husband who works at a large east side uh, software company, uh, earns you know somewhere between $100,000 and $150,000 per year, uh, has been married um, to his wife for, for 20 years, they've got two children, let's say that those children are ages you know 8 and 12 years old. Um, the wife has a high school education but doesn't have a lot of work experience. She might have some work experience in retail prior to um, being married and, and maybe even after the marriage, but really has dedicated in her life to be able to take care of the, the children and the family is involved in the, in the children's events in school. Um, both parties working very hard, just in, in different capacities. The husband, of course, is, is making money, and and uh, the, the wife is, is uh, reaping other benefits associated with the work that she's doing. However, um, there's no income being generated from that. Um, so based on a 20-year marriage where there are children and the wife has been you know, staying home to take care of those children, I think it's safe to conclude that there will probably be some maintenance ordered in that particular case. But then the question becomes, well, if there is going to be maintenance, how much maintenance is going to be ordered, and for how long should that maintenance be ordered? Um, we, of course, um, know that there are specific factors that are you know, going to be considered by the court when making a determination as to whether uh, maintenance should be paid and for how long uh, it's going to be paid and for how much. Of course, RCW uh, 2609 defines the factors that the court is going to consider uh, regarding uh, whether maintenance is going to be the order or not, and, and in fact, the court is required to be able to consider those factors when making a determination about spousal maintenance. Um, I would, you know, kind of summarize those statutory factors. You know, the first analysis that needs to take place is need versus ability to pay. Um, really, this comes down to, um, on the attorney's part, to be able to draft financial declarations, whether it's going to be going into mediation or whether you're going to be presenting these at the time of trial. Uh, these financial declarations are something that the court does rely on to make a determination as to what it is uh, that the need of the spouse who is making a request for maintenance is and what the ability uh, for the spouse who's going to be paying it is going to be. So, um, and, and of course, uh, LFLR 10 uh, applies to both settlement conferences, mediations, and it applies to the time that you're going to take the case to trial. So I think that spending time on that financial declaration that you're going to be uh, submitting to the court, either on behalf of the wife in the scenario that I've given to you or the husband, is extremely important. If you know that the wife is going to have health insurance uh, that she's going to have to pay after the divorce is finalized, it's very important that you advise the wife, go out and do research about how much that health insurance is going to cost. because. Either at the time of the mediation, the wife can explain to the mediator exactly what that cost is going to be based on the research that she's done, or uh, at the time of trial, she's able to actually testify as to the research that she did. She called Group Health, or she called another uh, health insurance agency to determine what the cost of that would be. Um, and, and the same is true for the husband. I mean, if there are going to be, uh, if the house is going to be sold because neither party can afford it post dissolution, and there are going to be anticipated costs associated with uh, the, the housing expenses, you know, make sure that they do research so that they can testify. It's not some number that they've grabbed out of the sky. It's actual real uh, numbers that they've they, they've gotten from doing the research that they need to be able to do. Um, another uh, factor, of course, that the court is going to consider is going to be the age, the health, the work history of each one of the parties. 
All of these things really need to be considered when making a determination and fashioning a spousal maintenance uh, award in, in the case. Um, the closer that the parties are to uh, retirement age can have a significant factor in what the duration of the maintenance would be. Um, if there are issues regarding each one of the ages of the spouses that is going to impact the court's analysis regarding spousal maintenance, those things should be brought to the court's attention or to the mediator's attention uh, at the time that you're trying to settle the case. Um, health issues can frequently come up in situations regarding spousal maintenance. And it's, it's important even if somebody has a health issue that may not be something that would be characterized as dis, uh, a disability that would you know, say that they can't work at all. But I think that because these things are ongoing, if there's going to be a maintenance obligation, and that, of course, depends on whether it's modifiable or non-modifiable, but if you bring up a health issue that may not be something that is completely, uh, uh, says that a, a spouse is disabled, you know, if there needs to be a modification case in the future and you've raised that issue in the divorce proceeding, that may be something then that you can draw on later on if there needs to be a modification if, if that health issue, you know, uh, gets worse over, over time. Of course, then, uh, the work history of the parties is something that the court is going to consider regarding an award of spousal maintenance. Um, in this you know, uh, circumstance, I think that, that the wife, uh, you know, if she's been out of the workforce for a significant period of time, um, that's going to be something that she may need to go back to, uh, get training or additional education, something that's going to assist her in, in, in being able to be more self-sufficient in the future. But even with all of these uh, different factors and the analysis that I'm uh, applying with respect to RCW 2609080, uh, there really still are no specific guidelines that Washington state courts are going to follow with respect to the duration and the amount of spousal maintenance that would be ordered. Um, it, 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 I use an analogy with respect to child support because we, of course, have a schedule that child support is going to be paid. We use each uh, uh, party's combined monthly net income to be able to determine on the child support schedule what that amount is going to be. We know what the standard calculation is going to be. Of course, the court can deviate from that based on factors uh, pursuant to the statute. But at least under that scenario, we do have some type of a guideline that's going to say this is what the standard calculation of support would be. In spousal maintenance cases, we really don't have any of that. So one of the things that, um, you know, when I began practicing, uh, uh, I, uh, of course, came across uh, Judge Windsor's article and, and uh, treatise, and I'm sure that most people are familiar with this treatise. If you're not, it's a really good thing for you to go out and, and read. Um, and and um, he provides us with, with guidelines regarding judicial discretion and the exercise of that discretion with respect to uh, spouses going through a marital dissolution proceeding. Um, one of the things that he describes in his article is that, you know, in a short-term marriage, really what the goal of the court is to do, and, and, and maybe you characterize this as about five years or less, there's no bright line in terms of this, but what you do is you want to put the parties back in the position that they were before they got married, because they really haven't relied on, you know, um, things or choices that they've made during the marriage itself sufficiently enough to be able to impact uh, one of the spouse's, you know, ability to be able to be self-sufficient. And so putting the parties back in the position that they were before the marriage would be the goal in a, in a shorter term marriage. There certainly can be short term marriages in which that would not be something that the court would do depending upon the factual circumstances of the case. But in general, that's that's one of the uh, uh, philosophies that is, is promulgated in this article. And then on the other end of the spectrum, of course, a marriage of 25 years or more or a long term marriage. Um, you know, the goal of the court may be to be able to put the parties in respective equal positions for the remainder of their lives, assuming that each party is working to the fullest extent of their capacity. And then, of course, anything uh, in between 5 and 25 years, and again, these aren't bright lines, but um, would be something that uh, would be a mid-range marriage. And so you would use a little bit of each one of those reasoning and analysis to make a determination as to what would be appropriate with respect to an award of spousal maintenance. Um, some family law practitioners, when making uh, and advising their clients about this, will use some kind of a rule of thumb, though, with respect to the duration of marriage. I mean, when your client comes in and asks you, well, what is my, you know, exposure to pay maintenance or, you know, how much maintenance would I be receiving, you know, in the future and for how long? Um, some family law practitioners will use a ratio of four years to one year um, for every four years of marriage that you get a year of spousal support. Um, other family law practitioners will use a 3 to 1 ratio. Some will use a 5 to 1 ratio. I think that it's really important on this particular issue, if you're going to be trying a case, to be able to get as much information as you can about the judicial officer that you're potentially going to be in front of. Because there is so much discretion 
um, in this realm that, and usually the court is not going to be overturned on appeal with respect to a, a award of spousal maintenance. And so it's really wise, talk to your colleagues, talk to other attorneys. If you know the judicial officer that you're going to be in front of to find out what is that judicial officer's philosophy on the award of, of spousal support or spousal maintenance. Um, Another way that you can do, and that's with respect to the duration of, of, of uh, the maintenance obligation, would be income equalizing approach to maintenance. And under that scenario, what you could do to determine what the amount of maintenance would be is, and you can draw on what it would be for the child support schedule with respect to, um, you know, what, if one of the spouses is, is not earning any income, there's going to be a certain amount of income that would be imputed to that spouse. You know, take both of their incomes, add them together, divide by two, and then the spouse who's going to be paying would pay the difference to the other spouse um, for that 50% of, um, of, the, uh, uh, of the, um, the amount that would be paid. So an income equalizing approach would be something that you could do. Um, and then, of course, diminishing maintenance over time would be another one of the things that you could do um, in a situation, let's say that there's a five-year obligation. Let's, uh, for the first uh, three years, the obligation would be a certain amount of money. Uh, for the last two years, that obligation would go down potentially, and the philosophy behind that would be that the spouse is earning, uh, who's receiving the maintenance is earning additional money because maybe um, in the scenario that I gave, she's earning more uh, funds, she's gotten the training that she would need to, or she's been in the workforce for a certain period of time, and it's anticipated that she would earn a little bit more money than she was at the time that the actual divorce was um, finalized.